بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله فلا يضر الا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد first of all may Allah reward you all for coming here uh, especially those again from distances and from Detroit and more so from our dear and special brothers from Windsor that drove all the way out here Jazakumullah khair and everyone may Allah reward you every step of your way uh, if there's not if you're squashed in the back you can move up we can move up over here I mean you don't have to leave room in the front also may Allah reward those brothers who organized and publicized about this event and those who made the banners and you see that banner by Muhammad Sajid Jazakumullah khair for that as you see the topic is the first of a series that we will be having inshallah throughout this vacation as the people are committing sins inshallah we're gathered here to shower away our sins as they're gathered to celebrate that which Allah prohibited we're gathered here to wash away our sins and that's how the true believers are uh, the angels are making istighfar for you what more do you want while if, since you left your house the angels are making istighfar for you the ants in the ground are making istighfar for you the whales in the ocean are making istighfar for you why because you all came here for no other purpose than to learn islam we ask Allah that as we met here today, we meet on the judge, in, the, uh, in the judgment day in the peak of heaven, insha'Allah. The, the topic today, the first of a series, is the heroes of Islam, or men with legacies. If you recall, we had a seminar once ago, long, some time ago, about women with legacies. This is to the opposing side of it. You know, a lot of brothers were mad and they uh, refused to attend this. So now you have your chance, insha'Allah. And uh, we're going to talk about men who are heroes of Islam. When I was thinking about this topic, and actually how this came up was Muhammad was sitting one time in Yusuf, and we were just talking, we said, rather than feed brothers waste their time in Christmas vacation, let us just meet and, and, and have some talks. And from there it grew, and alhamdulillah, it was organized, and the topic was taken, and I began to review what kind of men am I going to talk about. The first man I wanted to talk about, was not the one I want to talk, I'm talking about today. When I was researching about his life, which I'm going to do tomorrow, inshallah, if we meet here tomorrow and Allah gives us life, the one I wanted to do tomorrow is the one I was researching. But then I found his teacher. His teacher was more unique than he was. And the reason I chose this man is a special reason. I looked at the situation of the Ummah today, and you see how the Ummah is, especially now. Our brothers in Iraq are being... Uh, terrorized. Our brothers uh, in Palestine are being killed and annihilated every day. Our brothers in Kashmir, Turkestan, every single inch of this world are being attacked. You know, before we used to have our leaders give statements and say we oppose this. Now you don't even have that anymore. Now you don't have that. Now it's all swaying with the superpower and whatever they di- say, we, s- we say we adhere and we listen to. And I looked back in history and I said, this must have happened some time before. And exactly what we're going through today happened some time ago. I didn't want to talk about Sahaba, not because we don't love them. May Allah enjoin us with them in heaven. And they're worth talking about every time we're going to mention a few of them. But some people tend to think Sahaba are special. They were victorious because they're special. 
Because, you know, they have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam amongst them. They have special miracles. Even if you try to pull that out of their mind, it still sticks out. But they have the Prophet amongst them. That's why he did this. That's why Mus'ab ibn Umayyad did this. That's why Abu Bakr did this. That's why Abu... it sticks in your mind. So I wanted to choose someone who's not a Sahabi. He's not a Tabi'i. Tabi'i is the second generation. He's not a Tabi'i Tabi'i. And he's not a recent person. He's sort of in the middle. In the middle. And I want you to think with me good. Who is it? Yes. <laughs> How did you know? Yes. Yes, exactly. Actually, he stayed all last night over here trying to think the name and he never got it. I think he got it now. Uh, yes, our topic today is about a man called Nur al-Din Zinki. Before I tell you about this man, we're not going to talk only about heroes who fought battles in this series. We're going to talk about men who were heroes in knowledge. Men who were heroes in reviving the aqeedah of Islam. Today's topic is going to be about a hero who probably had it all. And when I talk about this man, I want all of you to be this man. I want all of us to be. It's enough that we have what we're going through today. We want to be like this man in order for us to revive the ummah and get it out of this gutter that it's in. Before I begin, I want to give you, alaykum wa rahmatullah. Before I begin, I want to give you a poem that was said by two people. There was a man called Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, Abdul Malik ibn al-Mubarak. Abdul Malik ibn al-Mubarak was a man who was always in the battlefield. Always, from battlefield to battlefield. He had a buddy in his time, scholars, high people, everyone knows these people. Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad. And he is trying to tell his buddy Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, who Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad was a worshipper. He was a mujahid, but more into worshipping. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak was more into the battlefield. So one time he went into the battlefield, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, and he sent his buddy a letter. And he told him, this man was called not Al-Fudayl ibn Abiyad, but rather Abid al-Haramayn. Abid al-Haramayn means he worshipped so much that the two holy shrines, Mecca and Medina, are known to him that he always used to be in them worshipping Allah. He said, Ya Abid al-Haramayn, law absartana, لعلمت أنك في العبادة تلعب. If you see what we're doing, Abid al Haramain, you're over there worshiping in the Haram. If you see what we're doing, you think that worshiping you're doing is just a mere joke. من كان يحضب خده بدموعه فنحورنا بدماءنا ستخضب. If you shed tears on your cheek, we shed blood on our chest. أو كان يتعب خيله في باطل فخيولنا يوم الصبيحة تتعب Our horses, you take your horses, you go shopping, you do things for your family, you go to the masjid. We take our horses to raise the, the, the word of لا إله إلا الله on top of the earth. ريح العبير لكم The smell of musk, we put cologne on. That's what we smell, we enjoy our life. ريح العبير لكم ورحن وهج, وهج الصنادق والتراب الأحمر meaning that dirt that we smell when the horses are kicking on the earth that's what we smell when you're out there smelling the musk and the beautiful colognes of the sight but we enjoy that more and then he said Allah told us long poem I'm going to summarize it for you so we can get on our topic he said Allah told us something decisive and Allah and his messenger never, never lie he who smells the dust in the battlefield for the sake of Allah will never smell the smoke of hell for you. He, the one who said the martyrs will never die, and then he put at the end, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ When Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad heard that, the Abid, he began to cry and cry, meaning that's right, what he's saying is right. They smell the mosque, we smell the mosque, they go and smell the dust of the camels. We sit amongst our family shopping and taking our cars to maybe halal places. They use their horses and their cars to raise the flag of La ilaha illallah. What a difference! That's a sample between a worshipper and one who is knowledgeable and he fights for the sake of Allah. Our topic today is about Nur al-Din, Mahmud, the son of Imad al zinki Who is this man? When was he born? The reason I chose him again is in his time, he was facing the Crusaders. The Crusaders. Number one, he was facing in his time the Romans, a superpower. 
He was facing in his time hypocrites, Muslim leaders who are hypocrites, just like our leaders today, who even used to give parts of their land to the Romans and the Crusaders just to leave them in power or to give them a small part of the land. Just like us today, identical. Crusaders. Crusaders. Romans. In addition to the Romans, he was facing the Muslim hypocrites. Not only that, he was facing just like we face those deviant cults that we have today. Those companion cursors, those Fatimiyin, Abaydiyin, the Shia. He was facing those who were trying to spread their evil belief. They had one of their powerfulest nations that they ever had in their life in Egypt. This was in 511 after the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He's born, his father is a governor of Halab. Halab. What's Halab? Probably smaller than Dearborn. Smaller than Dearborn. It's as though, you know how, how back then it was, we say we have 26 Arabic countries or 36 Muslim countries or whatever it may be. That's not a lot. We had more back then. You know, every little town was divided into, like Dearborn would be a few blocks would be for this king. Next, Muslim king. Next, a few times, another Muslim king. And that's why the, the, the poet said about him, Al-Qabu Mamlakatin Fi Ghayri Mahalliha. You give them these names that they don't deserve. kal like a little, like a little uh, cat that claims it's a lion. kal Yahki Intifakham Sublat Al-Asadi. Like a little a tiny cat trying to tell you. You know why? Because when you used to hear their names, it's a sultan al-malik al-khalifa. You have to go through Allah al azim about seven or eight lines before you read his name, the leader. His town was a few blocks long. That's how it was. So Imad's father, uh, Nur al-Din's father is Imad. He was in charge of Halab. But he was a righteous man. He fought the crusaders. And he did, it wasn't victorious over them very much, but he did stop, try to stop them, and he raised his son very well. A hero can only raise a hero. A coward raises a coward. There's exceptions, but this is a general rule. This hero raised his son. I want you to pay, I'm not talking about these stories so we can listen to them and enjoy ourselves listening to them only. No, yes, alhamdulillah, we enjoy our history. We get out of this misery we're in to this bright past that we had and enjoy ourselves, yes. However, we need to apply that on ourselves. Every one of you gotta be a Nuri Deen. Every one of you gotta be a Nuri Deen in his house. Everyone gotta be a Nuri Deen in his community. Everyone gotta be a Nuri Deen to raise the flag of La ilaha illallah on this earth. That's what you're waiting, that's what you, you were brought on this earth for. We weren't brought on this earth to make them cars or be engineers. Although education is very good and necessary, but that's not our purpose in life. Our purpose in life is to spread the word of La ilaha illallah throughout this globe. So his father raised him young. How did he raise him? The first thing he started with him is knowledge. Knowledge, the halakat we have, the fifth, tawheed, tafsir. Those people who attend these halakat, we're not preparing you just for knowledge. We're preparing you for one day to be an uridin. If you can't be an uridin, you better make your son an uridin. Yes, that's our purpose, that's our goal. We don't go around making 10 or 12 halakat a week, consistent halakat a week, and just let it evaporate out of our mind. We're doing the same way that Nuruddin and his brothers and people like him achieve victory on this earth. I say the man I'm talking about today is probably among the best leaders ever after the five first khulafa, after Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Abdul, uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the next one after them was this man Nur al-Din. That's not my saying, that's the historian saying, Ibn al-Athir rahimahullah, in his tarikh, in his history, he says the best man out of after those first five people was Nur al-Din, although between them was approximately 450 years uh, uh, a gap. But he was among the best one. Why? His father raised him. How did he raise him? Knowledge. Quran. He starts off with Quran. Tafsir. Tawheed. Aqeedah. Everything. Until he made him love knowledge. Not only love knowledge, but love sunnah. This hero, when he took power after, who killed his father, was some of his slaves betrayed his father. Now the crusaders. See, the hypocrites always are a problem in this ummah. He fought the crusaders. They never harmed him. The ones who harmed him are his own slaves. His own slaves killed him. So who takes the leadership now back then? His son, Nur al-Din, the one we're talking about. He takes leadership, but he has knowledge in his mind. You know what the first thing he does? 
What would you be thinking the first thing he did when you got the Romans trying to destroy the Islamic Khilafah, the Abbasid Khilafah, which was only a Khilafah by its name. It had no power. Just by, they couldn't even stand that. Just a Khilafah by its name. When you had the Crusaders come in and invade it, when you had Palestine, Beit al Maqdis, our holy land, just like today, under the hands of the Crusaders with massacres, everything. Just like we have the Jews today massacring and bombing and killing and genocide, they had the Crusaders back then at that time. What do you think the first thing he did when he took leadership? Well, I would think he'd have to fall asleep. That's what I think. But you know what the first thing, one of the first things he did? <coughs> Was a back, a stab to those Shia. The first thing he said. No more hayya ala khayr al-amal. They say hayya, hayya ala khayr al-amal in their prayer. He said that's abolished. Number one. Number one. This minor list. Yeah, no it did. You got the massacre of the people. No. Everything is important in Islam. That's why it teaches taught us. There's nothing that's less important than others. Yes, sometimes, sometimes you may have priorities. But as soon as he took leadership, he said hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala khayr al-amal goes away. He loved the sunnah. He loved the sunnah. These minor things, he took them into consideration. That's what his teachers taught him. Not only that, you know what else he did? After, never would you ever see him in his groups of people except with hadith, Quran, seerah, anything good in his discussion. That's all he would have in his, when, his, uh, when his colleagues would meet together. All he would have is words of knowledge. No wasting of time. No gossip. No backbiting. You know, uh, they, one time they told him... Uh, uh, they told him a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And at the end of this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu smiled. At the end of the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu smiled. So usually, and I know this when I lecture, when I say hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu smiled, I, I look at the audience, they smile as well. It's a sunnah. You want to imitate the Prophet Sallallahu and especially when the Prophet Sallallahu smiles, there's really something behind it to smile. And it's sunnah. And he's sitting there with a the frown. Lord he did. Why aren't you smiling? You follow the sunnah precisely. How come you're not smiling? This young boy who lived, you know how he lived? 58 years. 58 years is life. Well, our fathers and grandfathers lived more than this. In 80 now, in 90, they can't do not 1%, even, even 0.001% of what this man does. Why can't you smile? And by the way, his jihad life was 28 consistent years, nearly day after day of jihad, 28 years of his 58 years life. He was born in 511, he died in 569 after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Why aren't you smiling, Nur din You know why he's not smiling? The worry of the Ummah out there, they're being attacked. The Muslims are being attacked. How can I smile? How can I smile? When the Ummah is being annihilated and killed. I'm afraid Allah will ask me about that on the Judgment Day. They know, you know, you know, among the story, you know, is how much he loved the Sunnah. Meaning when he didn't smile, he shocked everyone. The second thing, you know, is his worry is over the Ummah. His mind is not with him. In fact, they said he rarely ever smiled throughout his life. How can you smile? How can we smile, Wallah al Azim, when the massacres of the Ummah is going on like it is going on today? Every day, you hear houses being bombed in Palestine with the people in them. Every day, well, I was reading a letter, yes, it, I think it was today or yesterday, where your Chechenian brothers, your Chechenian brothers are sending a letter, you guys are in winter. Look at you all of you wearing jackets, you put your jackets over there, you wear socks, you close the door real quick when you come in, it's cold, and we have the heat. Imagine your brothers who have none of that. They said, fuck, a jacket. Wallahi, they're begging. They're begging, they don't have none of that. And how could we smile? How could we happy when, when this is our brothers? No, it did It was instilled in his heart. How could I do that? How could I smile when my brother's over there with nothing to cover his shoes or cover his body or the sky is the ceiling? How could I do that? So Nur al-Din refused to smile. You know how strict he was in Sunnah? You say the hero that I'm going to tell you what he did. The hero, he heard that the Prophet ﷺ used to put his sword in a unique way around his chest and around his stomach. In a unique way that they used to do back then. The way he used to do it and his army used to do it, was different. He heard it in a discussion in his, in his house. Who, who said it's a sunnah? It's a sunnah of adah. You know, if you want to imitate the Prophet because you love him, you can ask him for that. But it's not a sunnah, you know, of ibadah. So, as soon as he heard the hadith, he changed his sword on the spot in order the whole army, all the army, change your sword. You see that little tiny sunnah? 
But see what that little tiny sunnah is going to make of this man. Those little tiny things, the smiles, the hadith, the hayya ala, hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, what it made out of this hero. Because his father taught him knowledge as a young boy. He raised him as a young boy with knowledge. And he made him a hero that the word, I say, wallahi, I read the book from the time of Nuri Din till now. 1,000 years almost, almost 1,000 years. Bring me someone like him. Even his students, and I tell you, heroes only bring heroes. His students to Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. I was looking for Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi's history, looking in the volumes of books, when I fell upon his teacher. Who knows Nur al-Din? Who knows Nur al-Din? Rarely anyone knows him. But he's a hero that this man should be someone you look up to. These are the people we look up to. These are the people we follow in the footsteps. What did he do? Let's talk about his heroism. How heroic he was. He used to go as a leader. As a leader, you don't have to fight. And usually leaders don't fight. They're commanders. They direct and they set. No, when it was his turn, he was in the front lines of the battlefield every single time. Every single battlefield, he was in the front lines of it. Not only that, when his father taught him knowledge, he didn't just teach him knowledge. You know what he taught him with knowledge? Physical strength. He was so physically strong that he takes the size of two. If they take two bags on their back, two bags, he'd carry four. They carry four, he carry eight. He carries the double of a normal person, and he's the leader. He doesn't have to. When they told him, you know, they, they found him crying one time. What did he Why are you crying? He said, they attempted to kill me so many times and they couldn't kill me. He's crying. Why are you crying? So, yeah, that's good. You know, I'd be happy. I got along the life. He said, that means that Allah doesn't like me because he didn't choose me as to be a martyr. You see that? You see how his father raised him? Allah doesn't like me because when they told him, Nur al-Din, rest, Mahmoud, Nur al-Din Mahmoud is his name, rest, you shouldn't be fighting with us. You know if they kill you, it's a defeat for this ummah. We may be down and we may be nothing without you. He looked at him, he said, you guys have no, he's talking to scholars. He only kept around in scholars, not bums. He kept, he talked around and said, you guys got no manners with Allah? You guys got no manners with Allah? He said, why? He said, who's Mahmoud? Who's Mahmoud? Who's Nur al-Din? How did Allah save Islam before Nur al-Din? He will save it without Nur al-Din. Nur al-Din is nothing. Look how humble he was to Allah. When he fought battles, his strength was that his spear on a horse when they attacked him. They attacked him one time when he was in a, you know, back then, you know, if you were in my uh, Sira classes, uh, if you were in my Sira classes, uh, uh, how was the battle? Someone tell me from my Sira classes, how did I always, all the battles we took, how were they? How were they? Geographically, how, how did they fight? Divided into four groups. Five. five. Divided into five groups. Front, behind, right wing, left wing, center. Always like that. But when this man came, it was something in Arabic called Al-Qila'ah. If you've been to Arabic countries, they still have them today. These are high areas, which are very secluded. And how you fight these battlefields is different than what I taught you in the old Sira during the Prophet and Sahaba's time in early ages. What happens? They're qila'ah. They're very high walls. And in them they live and eat and everything and station in there. If you want to go attack and take that country or take what's behind that down, you got to go and surround them. And you stay, you see who's the stronger. You start shooting with arrows, with minjaniq, which is cannons of, 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 of fire. And you start shooting back and forth, you see who's good, one going to last. Sometimes, you're in the qala'ah, the Muslims are in the qala'ah, and they get on the attack. You see who's stronger. One time he was in the attack in there, and they ran him, the crusaders ran him out of there. He, it said that he was faster than the sword swinging. A sword was about to be swinging at him, he dodged it faster than the swing would hit him. And he left. He went back to his uh, land in Halab. He got, this was in Tarablus, by Lebanon. He went back, gathered his strength, and came back. Gathered what he could, and came back. He stood right in front of the Qal'a, where exactly they may kill him, nothing to shield him. They said, Nur al-Din, this is the wrong place to be. He said, what kind of talk is this? Wallah al-Azim, I will not be under a tree, under the shade of a tree, nor will I be hide behind the barrier until I revenge that which they did to us. Give me 1,000 heroic men, and I will not, not let nothing stand in front of me. 1,000, that was the same score. Give me 1,000 men, that's all I need. That's all he needs, 1,000 men who destroyed the crusaders and the Romans and everything. Every time he go, I need 1,000 men under his command. When he went and he seen the world is coming at him, they seen he's a danger. He had to unite the world. I tell you, there was a small town. Every small town had a leader. So he sent letters to the leader. 
Najm al-Din, Nur al-Din, Naim al-Din, all these leaders, that's how they used to call themselves. They send them letters, we're being attacked by the crusaders, by the Romans, by the hypocrites of the leaders of Muslims who give them the land. We're being attacked by them, so you must help us. He sent a letter to the leader, letters to every khatib of the Jum'ah. Learn, learn, because this is what you have to do one day, inshallah. Unite this ummah and send letters to those khatibs of the Jum'ah and then mass send letters to the ummah outside. Every leader, what's he going to do? I got no choice but to join him. Some of them were saying, this man's a crazy man. His prayer and worshiping made him crazy. What's he doing? He wants the whole world? What's he trying to do? He's a crazy man. And they said, we have no choice. Because if we don't accept, one of them was Fakhr al-Din. They told, he sat by his advisors. He got the letter. His advisor said, what do you think about this letter? He said, you join him. He said, no, I'm sitting. I'm going to be sitting. He said, the best decision, we're going to be sitting. No, no reason to fight. His prayer and his fasting got to his mind, they made him crazy. He's a crazy man now. Because he prayed and fasted and made dua a lot. The next morning, that same Fakhr al-Din is out in the street calling, Hayya al jihad He said, well yesterday you were just telling us you. He said, you know what he said? He said, if I don't join him, what's this shit going to write about me? My people are going to rebel against me because this ummah needs leaders. This ummah needs leaders and that's what we lack. We're like ummah, we're like sheep who go in front of anyone who leads us. We need true leaders abiding by the Quran and the Sunnah and everyone in himself has to be a leader as well. He said, what's history going to write about me? My, my people will rebel against me. Yes, and they joined him, nearly everyone joined him and he united, he united. Most of the, as you're going to see at the end, how much united, small little town, Halab he started off with, nearly half of the Arabic world, or more than the Arabic world, belonged under his control. He united him. And then he went. Some of the stories that they, they, they had, one time he was fighting, and on the front line next to him is a man. An arrow shoot, gets in his eye. And he looks at him. He says, brother, Wallahi, he's a man who's worried about his eye. He said, Wallahi, if you know what Allah saved you of Ajar, you'd wish the other one goes out as well. The man took the arrow out of his eye and went on and, and fighting. He went one time and he has behind him a man is the son of a man of a leader called Naim al-Din. Naim al-Din was a hypocrite. He was a hypocrite. When the crusaders came to him, he said, take my land, use it as you wish. Just like Saudi Arabia today, just like Kuwait today, just like they do today. Use our lands as you wish. Bases. Kill the Muslims. Hypocrites. These are like Naim al-Din. When he came, he took, he gave him the land to the crusaders and he said, use it as you wish. They used it. Now, he's coming after the Nur al-Din to take it over. And you know who has behind him? After they won and took it over again, he looks behind him and he has his son, the leader's son. He said, thank Allah, you have two blessings. We all have one blessing, you have two. Two blessings. One is that we're all victorious, that's our blessing. Your blessing is that man you saved from hellfire, your own father. You may be less than that what she's going through in hellfire. He took down 50, 50 of the biggest qal'as, big strongholds. I mean, if you've been to the Arabic world, there still remains of them. They're so huge, so well mounted, so well secured. He took 50, one after the other, one after the other. When he got to some areas like Asham, he surrounded Asham. Sham is pretty big. And first time, it didn't work out. Second time, didn't work out. Third time, the leader said, I'm going to give up and work with you. I'll be side by side. And they went and fought the Romans together. He had, he had, from Turkey, from Turkey all the way to Yemen. From Turkey to Yemen. He started with Halab. He had from Turkey to Yemen. From Egypt to Iraq. From Egypt to Iraq, from Turkey to Yemen, under his control. Yes, this is the hero we're talking about today. But this is not only aspect of his life. Was he only a hero? Was he only knowledgeable? He spread justice throughout his country. He gave the scholars salaries just so they can sit and teach people. He took care of the orphans. He took care of the widows. Anything that was needed, he took. One time they told him, they told him, Nur al-Din, your army is getting big. You need to pay for it, you know. You need to finance it more. Otherwise the army is not going to work. He said, where do you want me to get the money from? There's no money. There's no wealth. They said, you know those people you pay? The orphans, the widows, the poor people? Just take a little bit of their salary and give it to your soldiers. He says, no way. No way, wallahi, that will never happen. Why? Look at this unique statement and tell me what it means. He said, their arrows never miss. They fight when I'm not there. Your arrows miss sometimes. Your arrows miss sometimes. And you only fight when I'm around you. What does he mean by this statement? What does he mean? 
doesn't need a genius. He said, their arrows don't miss. They fight when I'm not around. Your arrows miss sometimes, and you only fight when I'm around you. He means there's dua. Their arrows go to Allah. They make the dua. We become victorious because of their dua. He didn't just depend on his power. It was dua that made him what he is. Their dua. Their arrows to Allah. Ya Allah, give him victory. Ya Allah. You think those widows are not going to be making dua? Those orphans, those young people, the poor, the knowledgeable, they're going to make it. That's the arrows. He needed that more than he needed the physical strength. That's what he was talking about. He was a hero. He was a humble man. You know, as I was telling you, if you read in the history books, if you read one of their names, you know, if you want to read about Qutbuddin uh, or Majdiddin, before you read his name, you read the victorious, the best, the one who the sun never seen uh, like him. And you go on seven, eight lines minimum. This is the minimum before you say his name. And you have to say a dua for him like that every Jum'ah. He changed all that. He said, just say, oh Allah, aid the poor servant of yours, Nur al-Din. Change all that. The poor servant of you, Nur al-Din. You know, one time, look at this. We don't only depend on power. How many of you get up and make dua for Allah for your brother? He was in Haram. An area called Haram. And he's surrounded in a Qal'a. An area, stronghold. He's surrounded. Look at this. And he's having trouble taking it over. What do you do? He's fighting and putting his forehead in the dirt and making dua. Ya Rab, Ya Rab. And they heard him saying, not, they didn't hear him saying actually, no one heard him saying. He was saying in his dua, and I'll tell you later how they found out. He was saying, Ya Rab, they're your slaves, and they're your be loyal to you. They, they're the ones who loyal you. They're your slaves, and they're your enemies. Ya Allah, give victory of those slaves who are your loyalties over your slaves who are your enemies. Ya Allah. Ya Allah, don't destroy us for the sins of Nur al-Din. Ya Allah, Nur al-Din is a mere dog. He's being humble to Allah. Nur al-Din is a mere dog. Ya Allah, forgive us and don't take my ummah because of my personal sins. And they go. And he keeps making dua and crying and making dua. They're having trouble taking this uh, harem down. You know what happened? The next day one of his advisor scholars says, I've seen a dream. And he goes to him. In the dream, what he's seeing, well, these are authentic stories, not something made up. Authentic books, Ibn al Athir writes a lot about him because this man's so unique. This man is forgotten of our minds, but we must revive his name. You know, he goes, the, 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 the advisor, the scholar said, uh, I seen in my dream, and what he had seen in his dream was a group of people came, commanders, and very nice looking man, and very, you know, Islamically uh, righteous man. And one of their leaders, their best looking leader, came up to him and said, Within one night, you're going to take Haram down. And he left. He said, but who are you? And what's the proof that you're going to take, we're going to take Haram down? He said, your commander made the dua, the dua I mentioned. He said in his dua, Oh Allah, give aid to your servants who are your loyalties, over your servants who are your enemies, and don't take us by the sin of your dog, Nur al-Din. He calls himself a dog to Allah, humble to Allah. Don't take us by the sin of Nur al-Din. And he left the man. He said, come back, come back. Who are you? One of those people behind him said, you don't know who that is? Who was that? Who was that? Who was that, guys? That's the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He said, you don't know who that is? That's the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And as you know, when you see the Prophet in your dream and he resembles the Prophet, you have to resemble the Prophet. You can't have a guy without a beard saying that's the Prophet, you know. That's not going to work like that, no. But if you have someone who resembles him, yes, that means he's the Prophet. You know, if you see someone who's blind hair, and he tells you I'm the Prophet, that's not the Prophet. That's not the Prophet. But if you see him, and overall, the characteristics of what's in your dream applies to that, the authentic hadith we know, that means what you seen was 100% the Prophet. 100% the Prophet. So he seen the Prophet, and he went. And he was stunned at this dream. He wakes up the next morning, and he's looking for Nur al-Din. Where's Nur al-Din? Praying, 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 praying. Always praying, Nur al-Din. And he waited and waited until Nur al-Din was done. So Nur al-Din told him, and he said, Nur al-Din, are you done? He said, yes. He said, I had a dream I want to tell you. And he told him the dream. He said, what's the sign? So that scholar, in respect to the... He didn't have a du'a before. But in respect to Nur al-Din, what did he take out? What did he take out? The dog. The dog. How could you call your leader the, the, the Nur al-Din, the great general, the dog? So he told him, the proof that he's right is you must have said this dua. And he took out the word dog. He said, no, I didn't say that dua. Say the whole dua again, exactly like he said it to you. 
He put in the dog back to show exactly. He said, yes, inshallah, we're going to be victorious. Maghrib time, they conquered Haram. To Ha, to Allah. Yes, this was a pious man. This was a man who controlled most of the world. He controlled most of the world. Yeah, his family had nothing to eat. This is a lesson to our women. One time his wife said, we need something. We need food. We need, we need to be luxurious. We his face turned pale when his wife said that. His face turned pale and said, where do you want me to get this for you? Where do you want me to get this? This is a man who controls the world and he doesn't got up and at home. Where do you want me to get this for you? I got three stores in, 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 in Damascus, in, 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 in Halab. I got three stores in Halab. They went to the store. She said, he said, take them all. They're for you, for his wife. Just leave me alone. I'm on a mission. <laughs> I'm on a mission. And this is a lesson for the women to learn. He said, I'm on a mission. How much, how much did the three stores bring him a month? 20 dinar, which is at that time nothing. Like a few cents pocket change in your money. That's all his wealth was. His personal wealth. If he wanted to take the world like his colleagues did, everyone a small land and he's rich off of it. But no, this man had a worry, which was to give victory to this ummah. Look at this unique dream. To show you how pious is, look at this unique dream. He had a dream once, and again it was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And the Prophet Sallallahu said, rescue me from those two blind people. <laughs> rescue me from those two blind people. Rescue me from those two blind people three times. The Prophet Sallallahu tell him. You know what he wakes up and does? As soon as he wakes up, he asks the scholars around him. Always the scholars. Always the knowledgeable. That's how his father trained him. What do you think about this? He said it's something in Medina. You have to go to Medina. What does he do? I told you. It's a thousand men. A thousand men. Come on. We got to go. Let's go to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He goes to Medina. He takes wealth. And he goes in Medina. He says, anyone who needs wealth, come on. We're going to give you wealth. You know, we're going to give you charity. Everyone comes. Except two people, blind people. They claim to be Muslim. They lived in an area in Medina where the family of Umar al-Khattab lived. Bani Umar al-Khattab, they lived over there. They lived amongst them. Everyone went to get from the donation because they were poor, except these two people. He was persistent. Bring me those two people. And they bring those two people. And he sits and investigates. And what are you doing here? Where did you come from? Are you Muslim? Yes, we're Muslim. And he goes on and talking, and talking, and talking. It found out that these two men are from Spain. Come in to take the Prophet ﷺ out of his grave and steal him and go back and stay. And he takes them and right next to the Prophet ﷺ's grave, he rescues the Prophet and chops their necks off. Yes, he rescued the Prophet ﷺ. This is not a, a lie. This is a real story. In fact, you know, a side story that doesn't concern Nuruddin. When my father was in Medina studying, this was about maybe 25 years ago, the people of Medina had a similar dream. Similar dream where the Prophet was saying, you know, rescue me or save me from that which is coming. If something bad is coming at him. And what it was, what it was waste, waste from the, the, the floods of Medina under the ground where the Prophet moving in to take away near the Prophet in Abu Bakr and Umar. They found that out. So they dug around the Prophet in Abu Bakr. This is recently, maybe 25 years or so ago. The old dumb people of Medina all know this. Because it wasn't one or two, it was tens of people who had it. So they went and rescued it. They didn't dig up the Prophet's grave, but they dug around it and around Abu Bakr and Umar and they sealed it with huge, huge cement and I don't know what else to seclude it from any water or any danger to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Yeah, the only honorable people see this kind. How many of you seen the Prophet in your dream? You have to see the Prophet in your dream. Why? If you live with the Prophet, if you read the Prophet's story, if you read this guy's story, I hope you all go and dream of Nur al-Din tonight, inshallah. But all of you have to see the Prophet in your dream if you truly live with him. If you don't live with him, if you don't like him, if you don't imitate him, that's a different story. But you have to live with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you have to live with him. Every day when you put your head to sleep, ah, I wish I was with him. How did he look? How did him and Abu Bakr and Umar used to always say and joke and talk and everything? Then you're going to see him in your dream. When you see him in the dream, that's one of the best signs of your lifetime. Yes, it is. And this man continues on with his legacy. And one of the secrets behind this man, I've said knowledge. He was heroic physically. And another thing, and probably the most important thing, someone tell me, I mentioned hints here and there. No, Yusuf, you're always talking about women. <laughs> this is men, men legacies, not women legacies, okay? <laughs> it's Ibadah. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, see, you, got, you see people, you see people like Ibn Taymiyyah, we may be, we may be in the future be talking about Ibn Taymiyyah and some of his students. You see some people who are in the time of Ibn Taymiyyah or similar to Ibn Taymiyyah before or after him, and they're not as popular as him. One of the main important things is like Ibn al-Qayyim said about Nur al-Din. He said his secret was ibadah. 
This man worshipped Allah. How many of you pray at night? Like Lord Din? Yeah, you may not be able to carry a sword like he did. But how many of you get up at night and pray? How many of you follow the sunnah like he did? How many of you imitate the Prophet and the Sahaba and love them and feel so agonized about what's going on to this ummah? That's under your control. There may be things not under your control, but there's things under your control. How many of you feel that? You know how his daily schedule was? He go after Isha, he doesn't talk to no one unless it's a necessity. Just like the Prophet ﷺ. He goes after Isha and sleeps. Middle of the night, he wakes up. That's all he sleeps. Maybe what it would be, a few hours. So he gets up. Middle of the night, he goes to the masjid and prays and prays. This is his wife telling us. And prays until Fajr. Fajr comes, he prays the Fajr. From Fajr until the sun rises, Zikr. Astaghfirullah alhamdulillah. He prays the two rak'ahs when the sun rises. Then he sees if the Ummah has anything to do. Then he goes out in the marches and he wakes up the people and makes sure they pray. You know when one of his characteristics, first of all, Quran. Always recited Quran. Always like to hear Quran. One of his, this is, I'm not making, this is in his characteristic. This is what made him a hero. This is what you could do to make you a hero. Zikr. Always Zikr. Alhamdulillah, Sakhura. Wallahi, one of the things mentioned about him is something probably some people, you know, were probably upset when I said keep praying Taraweeh and come to Taraweeh. One of his characteristics is he never missed Taraweeh ever. Never missed Taraweeh. You know, some people, I was persistent against some people. I said, why, why are you missing Taraweeh? This is a holy month. If you can't pray at night. One of this giant's characteristics, as they narrate about him, he never missed Taraweeh. What kind of ummah are you? What, wallahi, what kind of failures are we if we couldn't pray Taraweeh in Ramadan? We can't pray Taraweeh in Ramadan. We got school, we got this, we got excuses. What kind of failures are there? What kind of cowards is ummah going to bring if you can't pray Taraweeh in Ramadan every night, 30 nights? You missed it. You missed it. Every hasana was 70 times as much. You missed out on it. We wanted the good for you. We want to see an ummah like Lord Adin. Wallahi. Wallahi. That's our goal. We don't want to put no one down. We don't want to put pressure on no one. We want to see heroes like Lord Adin. And that's why some people, you know, they get offended or something. Why are you persistent on us? We need people who pray at night. Not in Ramadan only. But after Ramadan only. Isn't there in this ummah someone who can make a dua? May Allah destroy the Jews? Isn't there? And Allah is going to respond to him? Isn't there someone going to say, Ya Allah, destroy Sharon and shred him into pieces for what he's doing, that butcher, that terrorist? Isn't there someone in this ummah who could say that? That's not illegal to say that, you know. You may not be able to donate and do other things, but you raise your hands to Allah, no one can stop you from doing that. May Allah destroy them. Ask Allah to destroy them. Your brothers in Palestine are going through the misery, just like noted these people were going through his time. This is among the characteristics of him. And he dies. He dies, noted deen. He dies at the age of 58. How do you think this hero dies? How do you think this hero dies who took down Fitri Qila and, and stopped the spread of the, uh, the, 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 the crusaders and the Romans from the other side and destroyed the hypocrites and united the world? How did this hero die? How? How? Jihad? No. He died like everyone who runs to death dies. Death runs away from him. <laughs> he did it. He's going in the battlefields. He wants his wish. His wish. You know what they caught him asking Allah one time. Though. One of his advisors in he said, I seen him asking Allah that the animals, the prey, shred my meat for the sake of Allah. The birds eat my meat. The prey eat my meat for the sake of Allah. And throw it out in the way. I don't want to be buried. I don't want to be in the cemetery. I don't want a monument over my grave. I want to be shredded for the sake of Allah. Just like Khalid ibn al-Walid. He dies on his bed from what today would be throat cancer. Running after death! Just like, just like some of the, 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 the people with wisdom said, احرص على الموت تهب لك الحياة Go after death, life comes to you. You're vigorous. Khalid ibn al-Walid, hundreds of battles he fought. Over a hundred actually. Over a hundred he fought. And his goal was to die a martyr. How did he die? How did Khalid ibn al-Walid die? He said, I die like a, like a sheep on my bed, like any normal person would die. Let not the eyes of the coward ever go to sleep. Nothing to be afraid of. Nothing to be afraid of. A Muslim carries his soul on his hand when it's necessary. That's a Muslim. What does it mean to be a Muslim? To carry your soul on your hand like Nuruddin. did. I want to throw my soul out for Allah. A Muslim, when it comes that his people are antagonized or terrorized or killed or annihilated or the aqidah is defeated, a Muslim, you know what a Muslim does? He doesn't care about nothing. They scare him with prisons. He says, where's the key of the prison? 
He looks for the keys of the prison. Prison doesn't come to him when it's aqid. I'm not saying be stupid. There's some people who talk stupid stuff. And I'm saying if it means that we talk about adherence and renunciation, wala in bara, and stand in the faces of the modernists, if that means prison, where's the key to the prison? If it means that we talk about love and hate for the sake of the light, wallahi, where's the key? Inna Allah ashtara min al mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah yuqatiluna fi sabil Allah fa yaqtuluna wa yuqtaluna. Allah bought your soul. You want heaven? It's not cheap. He bought your soul. When you sell your car, if you sell me your car, is it your business what I do with it? I could take it and smash it. I could take it and dump it. I could take it and renew it and replace something on it. It's not your business. You sold yourself to Allah to be a man who's going to enter heaven. Whether it's prison, you accept it. Whether it's death, you accept it. That's how we carry the legacy of those men who revived this ummah. This ummah today is dead. Wallah, it's dead today. Wallah, it's dead. That's why I bring this man who united. He died, 58 years old. He united the world. He stopped the crusaders. He stopped the Romans. He cut the heads of the hypocrites. And you know what else he did? He made sure the boundaries of the Islamic ummah were safe. The ummah has to feel safe. I can't sleep. You know what he started? Because the ummah has to feel safe. He started with the, 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 you know, the pigeons. The pigeons that leave from the area where he's in, they take them to the outskirts of his box. You know why? Because Nur al-Din can't stand to see one Muslim die. You know, if someone goes in the boundaries where he's not at a certain faraway area, by the time the messenger goes to Nur al-Din and tells him, and Nur al-Din sends an army over to help him, Muslim's gonna die. No, Nur al-Din can't have that. Nur al-Din has every, on the whole board, pigeons, as soon as you get the crusade, you see any of them, the Romans, the hypocrites, anyone want to attack you, just send a pigeon. And they did that. As soon as the pigeon comes over with him, days he's over there, stopping them from annihilating and killing the Muslims. This is what he did. You think this is what he did? He spread just court. And he takes Nur al-Din to court. Nur al-Din wants to give him the money and let him go. But he goes, and he goes to the judge, and he tells the judge, I'm the leader, but you look at me as though I'm a normal person, just like this man. And they stand there, and the judge enters a decision, of course, to Nur al-Din. Nur al-Din says, here's the wealth you claim is mine, take it. They're stunned. The judge said, and the man says, then why did you bring us to court? He said, I don't want to make my feel, I don't want it to be supreme over you, or feel that I'm supreme over you, to the point that I can't stand next to one of my people in court. And he gives it to him. And he goes, that's how they were. Yes, he opened something called Dar al-Adil, where a Jew can sue a Muslim. A Muslim can sue a Jew. When it came to messing with the blood of the Muslim, no, I'm going to annihilate him. And you're going to see tomorrow how he raised his best student, Salah al-Din. No, the blood of the Muslim, every gap of the blood of the Muslim is valuable to us. Like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught us. That's what I mad. And his son, Nur al-Din, and his student, Salah al-Din, a hero, only raises a hero. You know what else he did? One time his wife, and this is a lesson to the sisters, look at the wife behind this man. As Yusuf tried to say, this wife, this wife behind this man, one time wakes up and she's crying. And why do you think this wife is crying? What do you think? What do you think? She didn't get the dress she wanted. She didn't get the money she wanted. What do you think she started crying for? Someone give me a guess. What did he do? You talking like practical woman today talk. Woman today, yeah, he doesn't spend a lot of time with me. Wallahi, wallahi al-azim, we hear that today, and it's a problem. He's out in da'wah, he doesn't spend a lot of time with me. You're not making enough money. She has a better house than me. She has a, we hear that every day. Wallahi, we hear that. These are not trained women. This woman was crying because she missed one night of night prayer. She missed one night of night prayer. How could she miss that one night of night prayer? You know what? She said, I missed one night of night prayer. They sit and discuss it. What do they sit and discuss? What kind of car are we going to get? Where are we going to move? The house in the palace we're going to get in Bloomfield Hills and, and Canton and whatever it may be. You know what they discuss? How are we going to train this ummah to wake up at night? A mistake she did. You know what it caused? He established what's called the mitzvah. He on the top of the hilltop, just before the one-third end of the night when the angels come down, shoots with the mitzvah, makes noise, everyone wakes up and prays at night. He established that. Prayer at night. He raised the ummah like that. This was, this was this giant. This was this time. May Allah have mercy on him. And allow from this ummah, from our ummah, people to follow him. You know his characteristic is he never was seen missing or late for a salah in jama'ah. 
Look at that. Look at that. He's not a man who took a sword and went and fought. Before we can even think of being like him, we need pre, 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 you know, pre-tests and pre, uh, you know, exercises. Prayer in Jama'ah. You pray next, you, you live next to the masjid. Why don't you in the masjid? In Jama'ah. Not pray in Jama'ah. On time. We don't even pray on time. How can you be even equivalent to Nur al-Din if you don't start with these foundations? That's what we're doing. That's our process today. When we go and give halakat, when we go and teach fiqh, when we go and teach it, we want people like Nur al-Din. Wallahi, our hope, our hope is from those people we teach, when it's going to come out like Nur al-Din. Wallahi, wallahi, our hope. And if it's not that, I want to be dead in my grave one day, and the angels come and tell me, the punishment on you, in the grave is gone. And I say, why? They tell me, one of your students, and one of your son's students, or one of your son's son's students, is like Nur al-Din, and Allah give you the ajr for that and raise you. That's how what we want. That's our purpose in life. We want to make Islam. We want to make when one person, when one person messes with one of our women, we annihilate the country. When one drop of blood gets down from any Muslim, any Muslim on this planet, we teach them a lesson that they never forget. Like Muhammad Iqbal said, when in, in one of his poems he said, Muhammad Iqbal, he said, when they used to, he, he's talking about his time, you know, Muhammad Iqbal was in the 60s, he's talking about how the ummah teared up and it's no good, and he's comparing it to the old times. He said, in the old times, in those old times, when someone used to come and just try or think of messing with us, we used to take our feet and step on his foot, head, on his foot. Now, he says, وَآلَمَنِي 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 سُؤَالُ الدَّهْرِ أَيْنَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ And the question is, where are the Muslims? Where are the Muslims to take the leadership of the world and provide justice for the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims? Where are they? They're gone. And that's your duty. And that's, if you can't do that, it's your son's duty. If you can't do it in your house, you do it in your community or wherever it may be. Jazakum Allah khair for listening. If there's any questions, we take the questions. My question about the Roman Empire, you know, it's just, uh, for the Roman Empire and the Crusaders, they were separately or not together? Well, uh, the Roman Empire was also called, at times, they had factions. Some of it belonged under the Romans, and some leaders thought they were powerful, that they did not uh, work under the Roman Empire. Like we're going to see tomorrow, uh, amongst them is uh, one called Shirak. He didn't want to work under the Roman Empire, and he went and led a huge army by himself. So at times it could be together, and at times it could be separate. Is the Salafidin take over right after he died? Uh, Salafidin, I'll talk about it tomorrow, and yes, yes, he did take over. Uh, one of the unique things about this man is that he sent Salafidin, you know some people say, we got the Jews and Christians, they're the enemies. Let's just finish them off, then we get to settle our score between these sects. He sent Salah al-Din, that's why the Shia hate Salah al-Din. The Shia hate Salah al-Din, they spread rumors about him. There's a lot of historians who write evil stuff about Salah al-Din. A lot of stuff about Salah al-Din, you know why? Because Salah al-Din put an end to the Fatimiyin and Ubaidiyin. They had a nation in Egypt. A strong nation like they have in Iran today, companion curses. They hate Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman. In fact, the Fatimiyin and the Ubaidiyin, today some Shia claim they're not part of them, but they fall under, you know, the Shia is a big name, and under its subsect, some of it is the Twelve, or some of it is other sects. Among those is the Ubaidiyin, Fatimiyin. These people believe some of their leaders were, were, were Allah. That's how, to the extent they were. That's why some of the Shia today try to seclude themselves from this sect itself, but they do fall. You know what he did? He sent Salah al-Din, as you're going to see, inshallah, tomorrow, to put an end to it. And the Azhar that you have today was Shia. The Azhar that you have today was Shia to send Salah. He replaced it, inshallah, tomorrow, I'll be talking about how he did that. So our fight is not only with the Jews and Christians, with those hypocrites of our leaders of ours, King Fahad, the leader of Kuwait, where they tell you, come, open our land for you, bomb your brothers in Iraq. Or they talk about your brothers, they, 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 uh, 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 they allow their, their bases to be used against the Muslims. Uh, our problem is also with those people who are deviant sex, who are a cancer within this ummah. If you don't eliminate that cancer, you won't be able to prosper and work and be healthy. Yes, sir. Actually, I don't know too much about the history of Palestine now, but like a friend of mine had this, um, this uh, discussion with uh, some Islamists, and he, um, I guess he, was, <coughs> yeah, he knew a little bit more about it, more about Palestine or whatever than us. 
they gave him this article that came in a newspaper about uh, how Palestine belongs to Jews and whatever, and because we didn't know much, I guess he thought he won over the topic about, you know, like how how the the Palestinian land is uh, is promised to to Jews, not Muslims. He briefly like explained how how it's supposed to be our land or whatever. Well, the basic and the simple answer to that is, if I bought this house or I built this house, who does it belong to? Who does it belong to? Me. I'm a Muslim. It belongs to me. It belongs to me. And that's what uh, this house, this property belongs to, is me. Who's the one who built the Aqsa? Who built the Aqsa? Adam salam built it. Adam is a considered a Muslim. He's the first one who built it in chain after chain after messenger of Allah Yahya and Isa among their missions among their missions was to liberate the lands of the Aqsa that's among the Prophet's own mission to liberate the Aqsa so why we consider ours? because it's our messengers Adam السلام, the one who built it and it continues on Islam, Islam I don't think anyone can refute that if you start thinking about the promises anyone who follows in Adam's footsteps has the right to Palestine has the right to Palestine because he's the builder, he's the builder of Beit al Maqdis. Anyone who deviates now is does not uh, belong to them. No. Uh, by the way, I forgot something very important. Good question. Nur al Din, and keep your goals high like Nur al Din did. You know what he did one time? He gathered all his carpenters, the one who worked with wood, and he built. Tells, told him build a huge member. He's out in Halab. The distance between Halab and the Aqsa is a huge distance. He said, build the best looking, biggest member you can build. You know where that member is going to go? Where is that member going to go? Palestine and the Aqsa. He built the hope up. I, my hope? That's my hope. I'm not going to die. I'm Ahmed. You, Muhammad, Yusuf, all of you. I'm not going to die till Islam becomes victorious. I'm going to make it truthful. And you know what he did? He went over there and he built it. And people, what happened when Noah was building the, the, the ship? What happened? They called him crazy. You mark me. Every time people pass by from uh, North people, they, they, they say, Oh, you're going to make up shit out of wood, and this is going to secure you? Uh, and they masked him. And the same thing happened to Nur al Din. And, and he said, oh, I told them, Nuh told them, If you mark us, we're going to mark you like you marked us. Then came Nur al-Din, he built a huge member, and everyone passed by, what's this huge beautiful member for? What's the speech for? What is it for? And they tell him that this member, he's telling him this member is what we're going to give a speech on in Palestine. That member remained intact in Damascus for 45 years, till someone came and liberated it. You get that story tomorrow if you're here, inshallah. <laughs> Any more questions? <coughs> yes, you can. You know, question myself, uh, my question is about the angels. Is it true that uh, some of the angels, uh, uh, the, you know, when Allah, uh, or like the question is, when Allah uh, commanded the angels to prostrate to Adam, what was... No, no, the heat, not uh, please. Moses, lower the heat, all the way down. Bring the coffee. Oh, the angels were hiding something from Allah. How come? How come? I couldn't understand it. How do you mean? You know, when, when Allah ordered the angels to, to prostrate the, uh, to, um, to Adam. And uh, then Allah said, So, how come the angels hiding something from Allah? وَأَعْلَمُ is a form of con conversational form of uh, between Allah and the angels just like you find doesn't mean that Allah didn't know it just because that's there doesn't mean Allah didn't know it uh, if you see some of the hadith where Allah has conversation with angels uh, he asks some in a hadith did you take the son of my beloved servant isn't that similar to that? He says, didn't you take the son of my brother? They say, yes, Allah, we took the son. When Allah asked, did he know that or no? 
Did he know that form of conversation to show us uh, in the Quran? Does it mean he didn't know it? Uh, in fact, the hadith, three questions. And they say, yes, we did. Did Allah not know? Yes, of course, you know, but it's form of conversation. Just like the one who gets out of hellfire, the last one to get out of hellfire. And Allah communicates with him. Is does not Allah does Allah not know? Of course Allah knows. However, that's a form of communication between them and Allah to probably most likely teach us. Yes, brother. Who? Go ahead. Is it haram to have pets? No, it's not haram to have pets. <laughs> what kind of pets? Like dogs. Yeah, yeah, that's haram. That's the, uh, yeah, the dog, you shouldn't have a dog, but you could have a cat, you could have a bird, you could have, you know, you shouldn't have a dog or anything that's not pure. Because as you know, the dog is not uh, uh, pure and clean. And the Prophet ﷺ deterred from having it. And he said, you know the angels, don't you? You know the angels? The angels protect you. And if you, would you rather have the angels protect you or a dog protect you? Yeah, see, there you go. So that means you don't need a dog. Because if you bring the dog, that means the angels leave. If you bring the angels, the dog has to leave. So, <laughs> so uh, you have the choice, and I want you to be protected by the angels, okay? He wasn't the Khalifa. The Abbas was the Khalifa then. And but they they had nothing. They had no, they were a Khilafa by name. Just like just like all of them were. They were all leaders by name. What happens when you have on a, a town half of one fourth of their board? You got nothing. It was all mere names. And you know, we're gonna see tomorrow what happened when Salah al took over the Aqsa and what he did with the Khilafa. Uh, yeah, there was Khilafa and he was a, no, he was the governor. He was a big governor, that's all. But what he did strengthened the Islamic Ummah. As a governor only, the Khilafah was not in, in, in his hands. Yeah. The Abbasi got in a point where they stopped control. Do what you want, we're out of it, just by name. We're just leaders by name. Everyone could do whatever they wanted. When you see tomorrow, inshallah, what Salah had been did, they approved him of what he did. When he did, of course they're going to approve him. What he did was eliminate the hypocrites and unite the Ummah and strengthen them. Because he didn't... Uh, uh, Nur al-Din and Salah al-Din did not say, okay, we're going to rebel. Just because it's weak Khilafah, we're going to rebel against it. Is there any questions there, uh, uh, Saeed? Yes. Halab, 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 uh, of Halab before him. And he gave him, the what happened was the leader who dies gives power to the uh, son. Okay, we stop here. Laura, I'm going to ask a last question about... Uh, uh, because it's, uh, it's a good issue nowadays, uh, the Messiah. So, uh, I, I don't know if you talk about it, but you know, I've been asked a lot about this uh, kind of stuff. Can you make Messiah on uh, the stuff, the... or uh, what kind of stuff is it? Uh, you know, the Messiah and the Saat, we know of... Uh, if you attended our fiqh class, we attended, we talked about this in depth. Masih on the socks is permissible just like it is in, on the leather, just like it is on the khuf. In Arabic, al-jawrab means the socks, al-khuf means the leather. And uh, why it's permissible to wipe on the socks when you make wudu, if you wore them while you're pure, is because, first of all, qiyas, we have something called qiyas. Socks and khuf are similar, so we do qiyas. Since it's permissible to wipe on the khuf, it's permissible to wipe on the socks. Number one. Even stronger than that, even stronger than that, is the, uh, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum doing, where we have authentic narration that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum wiped on their socks. It's clearly permissible to wipe on your socks. Now some people come and tell us, it has to be thick, it has to be thin, you got to walk two miles with it before it, something happens to it. I say, all that, we ask you, where's your proof? If you got proof on that, we take it from you. 
You know, when I was teaching this, I used to teach it before, and I used to say, Wallahi, a long time ago, and, and probably the tapes are available. I used to say, before I even read it, I used to say, the Sahaba sucks, and their hope has to have hope. See, so, you see some people today, they say, if it has a hole, we can't wait for it. I say, if it has a hole, of course, if it half of it is not missing, that's a different story. But minor holes in here and there, you know, that, that, that's, that's permissible. And I used to say that before I even, before I even knew and found an authentic hadith where some of the tabi'in say, the sahabas, shak, or khuf, and khuf, used to have holes in them. Why? It's only obvious. The sahaba used to walk in their houses, and when they walk in their houses, sit up and st stitch up their shoes. The other socks, stitch up their shoes. So if they stitch up their shoes, their socks are going to be okay, meaning they both have holes. Uh, you know, if someone doesn't feel it's right, he's a blind follower of a madhab, that's his business, you know, to follow that. But I believe even the, 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 the only madhab that some people claim is the one that didn't allow wiping on the socks is the Hanafi madhab. And I say they don't even know their madhab. I say this and I know what I'm saying. I say those people who claim that wiping on the socks is not part of the Hanafi madhab do not know their madhab. They're ignorant. They're blind. Wallahi, they make big deals, you know. Unfortunately, they make big deals. One time I led prayer and some ignorant guy comes to me and I find coming to give me Eid. He's saying, Assalamu alaikum for the Eid. And he's asking, did you wipe on your socks or not? And I told him, you're a stupid brother. Why? Why are you stupid? You know why he's stupid? He said, because if you wiped on your socks, your prayer, my prayer is invalidated. I said, brother, you were in front of me in the khutbah just now, and three times you held a discussion in the khutbah. Which one? Don't worry about your khutbah, because it's already gone, because you already held me. He's sitting in my khutbah in front of me, and he's talking to them. You know, this is like, just like the people who killed the Hussein, they used to come and they killed the Prophet grandson, the beloved grandson, and they used to come and ask the scholars, is it haram to hail, kill a mosquito? You know, they, they come and ask about little things when they're doing the big things. Don't worry about your socks when you already invalidated because he's ignorant. They're ignorant kind of people. These people are blind, narrow followers of something the scholar said. I say Abu Hanifa himself on his deathbed, and it's available, and the references are available. Abu Hanifa on his deathbed wiped on his sock. And they told him, Abu Hanifa, you deterred from this all your life. It's something you deterred from. He said, I used to deter from it. And he said, don't come and tell me he said something after this. Because he said this on his deathbed. He said this on his deathbed. So that means Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, approved of this. I say, suppose they don't want to do it. I pray behind someone who wipes on his socks and he doesn't. Why can't you pray? If I believe wiping on your socks invalidates my prayer and I wipe on my socks to pray, my, yeah, and I truly, genuinely believe that, my prayer will be invalidated. But if I took the opinion that my socks, I can wipe on my socks, I can wipe on my socks, and, uh, and, uh, and I do that, my prayer is accepted. And the prayer behind me, inshallah, are all accepted. Because they don't have to adopt the same fiqh issue. Had it been a principle, of I say even the Twelvers. And I hate to say this, some of the scholars, if you read Ibn Kathir, you know the Shia, they don't even wipe on socks. They wipe on their hair foot, which is haram, you know. The Prophet ﷺ said, woe to the aqab from hellfire. If you read Ibn Kathir, the verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah, he says some scholars said, had it been this only problem they had, or had a sect came, and this was the only difference between us and them, we could still pray behind them. Why? Because they took the ijtihad from the verse, and they truly believe that ijtihad. So which one is worse? Wiping on a sock or wiping on a barefoot? Unfortunately, we have people today who are ignorant. They don't want to search. They heard two, three words there. And, and the sources are available. Where Abu Hanifa, your scholar, and his students, his biggest two students, Abu Hassan, who else? Abu Yusuf. Abu Abu Hassan and Abu Yusuf. Rahimahumullah, yes, they agreed, they agreed with their sheikh, they agreed with their sheikh that you wipe on your socks. So can we, can we the issue? That's the problem. I said, if it's okay, what other fiqh opinion you adopt, it's fine. But to make it a big issue and start instigating people and do this, no, we can make it a bigger issue and show you you're stupid, you're ignorant, you don't even know your madhab, you don't know your madhab, your own madhab. And you see, see they don't know their madhab. They heard a fatwa by a certain scholar they know. And they got this fatwa and they publicized it. 
You're on Abu Hanifa. Who do you like more? <laughs> who do you follow? You say you're Hanafi. Who do you follow? Abu Hanifa or a scholar who came in the 20s? And I want to know those Hanafis who claim to be blind followers of Abu Hanifa. His student, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan, came and he said, his student, does anyone deny Muhammad ibn al-Hassan is a student? He came and he said, one third of my sheikh's opinions I disagree on. Is Muhammad ibn al-Hassan Hanafi or what? What is he? What is Muhammad ibn al-Hassan? What is he? Hanafi. Okay, do you follow now? And one third of it is gone. He's, he uh, adopted his own opinion. One third of his opinion is gone. Do you adopt his opinion, Abu Hanifa or Muhammad? Are you Hanafi A or Hanafi B? Or this is just the first stage. This is the first stage. Muhammad al Hassan disagreed with Abu Hanifa. Are you Hanafi A, Hanafi B, or Hanafi C? And this is just before Abu Hanifa died. I want to know what kind of Hanafi are you? And the thing doesn't apply to Abu Hanifa. Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the same thing. You say I'm Hanbali? Okay, you're Hanbali. So which one of these factions within the Madhab are you? You go in some issues, you find within that Madhab dispute. Which one are you? That's why we tell this Ummah, follow the Dalil, follow the proof, unless you're retarded. If you're retarded, follow the Madhab blindly. If you don't have a brain where you can follow the proof of the Quran and the Sunnah, then yes, you are, you know, like a, like a donkey in a stew, you gotta follow exactly what's in front of you. You know, I hate to bring this up, but brothers are instigating this matter, and it needs to be replied that and replied that vigorously. I, I gave a lot of lectures, and I didn't bring this up, but inshallah has to be brought up because people have big mouths, and they're ignorant. I wish they were knowledgeable, you know, and they make it a big issue. You come after the ayin, you think he's coming to congratulate for the ayin, and ask, did you wipe on your side? You stupid idiot. What kind of, Wallahi al -Azim, this is a disgrace. What kind of ummah this is? What kind of ummah this is? Okay, you accept that opinion. I accept this opinion. Can we get along? No. You come and you gotta do, do this. Stop it. Stop it. And this is what caused the deviance in this ummah, the problem. Go to the companion cursors. Go to the deviants, the, the hypocrite leaders that we have today. Look, go to those who have, we have differences in the principle amongst like, each other. Okay, I think that's it. I say, uh, there's a question about Khilafah. This whole topic was how to establish Khilafah. I thought you had established Khilafah like Nuruddin established Khilafah from the beginning to the end.